Hey everybody, this is the fifth segment of chapter two in historical geology. And uh, the last segment I stopped at the Walterslow and uh, I hope you understood it. Remember the Walterslow just says that sometimes these, uh, these paleo sedimentary basins hundreds of miles wide. Uh, so to walk all the different sedimentary facies is taking a long time. And what he realized is that because of the the environments changed by the sea level going up and down. All you have to do is just look at the vertical segment, uh, the vertical sequence in a borehole, and you will be able to learn all the rocks which would occur horizontally. So you don't have to walk the basin anymore. You can just drill a couple of boreholes, and you will know exactly what kind of rocks occur in the whole basin. So this was one very important discovery, which uh, was done by Johannes Walter. Uh, in the in the 20th century, so it wasn't too long ago. And now we are at the sedimentary cycle, and I have to kind of draw it for you. So here we are. If you have a bar, borehole, it's easy to study, actually. You can study them on, on rock outcrops, too. So let's say we have a, a unconformity right here, and uh, start with pebbles here, continue with sand, then it goes into silt, and then it goes into clay, and then it goes back into silt, and then it goes back into sedim uh, sand, and it goes to pebbles. And there is another erosional surface. It goes into sand, let's say, silt, clay. Now, the pebble to pebble is what we call sedimentary cycle. Basically, that shows you a whole sea level cycle. During the transgression, you got the coarsest grains on the bottom, finest grains on top. During a regression, you have the finest grains on the bottom and the coarsest on the top. So this shows you a whole sea level cycle. This part is the transgression. In the middle of the clay is what we call peak transgression. Peak. It's peak. Transgression. And wherever you have the pebbles is going to be the peak regression. I cannot really write so well peak. I got to get a tablet or something. Regression. So wherever you have the pebbles, that shows the lowest sea level. Wherever you have the clay, shows the highest sea level. So the highest sea level is the peak transgression. Lowest sea level is the peak regression. And from pebble to pebble is what we call sedimentary cycle. So now we're going to talk about the most important sedimentary environment. And uh, it is quite important to read, to be able to tell uh, the original plate tectonic and some sedimentary environments, uh, because when you're looking for geologic resources such as water, oil, uh, probably other type of geologic resources like could be metal, metallic or non-metallic. It's really important to know what kind of plate tectonic setting did you have. So therefore, you can use the sedimentary rocks just to tell that. It's interesting, but uh, but you can. So the three major system I kind of want you to know is the silicic clastic long system, the silicic clastic short system, and the carbonate dominated system. And we're gonna go through them. So this first one is the siliciclastic long system right here. Uh, as you can see, the basically the eastern United States is a siliciclastic long system. Uh, like you have the mountains, which is the source of the sediment right here. And then you can see how the rivers bring the sediment and they get to the shoreline with mount meandering rivers and all that. And then they bring quartz dominated sand 
of quartz dominated sediment into the ocean, just like the Atlantic Ocean on the eastern coast. If for some reason you have mountains closer to the beach, then it it's it's somewhat different. It's more immature sediments. But in a long system, it's usually by the time you get to the beach, it's mostly quartz, so pretty mature sediment. It's important to know. So here we are, and I already kind of told you, so this slide just summarizes what I just told you. So when you have a, a complete sequence of depositional environments from the mountain all the way to the ocean be, uh, basin, we have a long system. So the sediments at the beginning of these systems are usually immature. And they are very unstable in composition, means that they have every kind of rock fragments. It's generally poorly sorted and very angular grains. Uh, if you have a true long system, like the continent is pretty big, then you will have enough t enough distance and time. So as the sediments travel from the source to the ocean, there is enough distance and time for them to completely weather to be pure quartz sandstone. And that is what we call the most mature sediment. Remember, I already mentioned it to you, but it's very, very important that you remember quartz sandstone is the most mature sedimentary rock, and of course the clay too, but but when you have uh, arcos or, or gray vacky or a lot of the conglomerates and bretch, those are very mature. So by the time it gets to the beach, it's going to be clean, mature quartz sandstone. That means that you have a relatively large continent because it has all the distance to do all this. So the sand at the end of the long system is going to be quartz sand. That is the most mature. Remember, it's, it's quite important to remember. So I already mentioned one of the best examples is the eastern United States going from the Appalachian all the way to the, to the beach. And this is how the sand looks like close up. See, it's a, it's a relatively pure quartz sandstone. It does have some like those... Um, yellowish grains, like some of them reddish uh, are garnets. There is a couple of amphiboles in it, possibly, but mostly quartz. So it's pretty um, mature, indicating that the, the source city is really far away from the beach. In the other case, when you have the siliciclastic short system, you have to imagine an oceanic-oceanic plate boundary, so where the continent go, one uh, the oceanic crust is going under the other oceanic crust, so therefore, all you will have is just islands forming. So the islands are small little areas, and the island forms because of volcanoes, so therefore, if you think about it, by erosion, the sediment will not go too far away because it's an island, so the, the ocean is right there. So what kind of sediment goes into the ocean? It doesn't have enough room to that to to weather away so therefore you're right in the ocean very immature sediment is going to settle down so you know that this area didn't have enough distance for the sediment to become mature so you kind of will think that it must have been most likely an oceanic oceanic plate boundary okay so that's pretty good it's really uh, logical and there is a lot of reasoning with which you can figure out what has happened a long long time ago sometimes so here is the, the last one, the carbonate dominated system. When you have a carbonated dominated system, to start with, that means that you are in the tropics. Secondly, that means it's a low lying, a flat area, and the, the sourced land is far away, so no siliciclastic sediment can come in. Usually, the siliciclastic sediment shuts down carbonate deposition because. The carbonate deposition mostly happens by animals and plants. And when siliciclastic sediment comes over, uh, those animals don't like, uh, they, most of them want to be in the photic zone. So the siliciclastic uh, deposit shuts it down. That's why if, if it's not completely tropical area or you have a lot of siliciclastic, like in an island, tropical island, the, the carbonates forming in deeper water where it's farther away from the land and the silicate source. But if you have like larger continents, these areas usually are um, flat, far away from the siliciclastic source land, so it's all carbonates.
and I have a couple of pictures showing you. This just um, I just threw away accidentally. This was the the Earth showing the tropical area, and actually I did have uh, a picture just like that in the in the carbonate when I went through the different racks and when we learned about the carbonate it showed you that it forms in the traffic mm -hmm. so that's the same thing I had here and here is a slide with showing the I took these pictures in Florida actually Key West, close to Key West it was Florida Keys and this area have been producing carbonates forever so here when you walk on the beach it's not sand like in, in Myrtle Beach or, or Georgia but you're walking actually on carbonate rocks full of low pools and this very typical plant is the mangrove which is very very characteristic for carbonate uh, producing environments and in these low pools as you can see these low green plants and low uh, snails so everything in these areas when they die they will make actually carbonate sediment now this here uh, is also a carbonate producing environment I took this picture in Belize and I did it when when actually went to Ambergris Key. So this shows you the corals right there. That's the coral reefs. The coral reefs are growing in very shallow water. So the top of them actually makes the waves to break. So wherever you see the breaking waves far away from the land, that tells you that something is going on. Like you might have a coral reef, especially if you're in the tropic zones. So whenever you have a barrier reef like this, you have to take a boat from the land to be able to go to snorkel. And this is how a very typical uh, beach looks like, a carbonate dominated beach. If you look at this sand, it's nothing but, but carbonate. So it's white sand, really, really white. And the water color is very typical, like azure blue, like that. It's very beautiful. This is Jamaica. I took this picture in Jamaica. And after finishing the different sedimentary environment, I want us to think about what might cause sea level changes. We talked about transgression and re regression, and we're going to talk more about this. But for now, I want you to know that we have two major categories. One is the global, when the whole Earth, the sea level is changing on, throughout the whole Earth. We call it eustatic. It's global, means the whole earth. It's right now, as you know, hopefully, we are experiencing a transgression. So glo globally, the sea level is going up. Uh, the, f the second one is when you have like some kind of plate tectonic reason that locally the sea level is going up or down in a certain area but we call that local. So we have global and local. Now, inside the global, we have different scales of sea level changes. It's very important. We have the long, medium, and shorter sea, sea level changes. If you think of the long-term sea level changes, those are like about 100 million years in duration. Uh, and those are the so-called ice ages versus greenhouse time. Okay, so ice age versus greenhouse time. And it might sound shocking to you. I think you already heard it from me, in, uh, physical judge. Right now, we are in what kind of are we greenhouse or ice house time? Yes, we are in ice house time. We are in an ice age right now. But we are in the part of the ice age where actually it's global warming, and we call that interglacial. Okay, the medium term sea level changes, they are like 40 million or so years long. And they are related to plate tectonic movements, plate tectonic movements, like when you have a um, supercontinent or the continents are moving apart like we have them now. And then the last one is the short term sea level changes. Those are kind of the most frequent and they can make big sea level changes. And these are climate changes caused by gravitational forces in the solar system. So please remember that the short term sea level changes are caused by climate changes and the underlying reason for those is the is the gravitational forces in the solar system that's the gravity of the different planets and their effect on our earth and they these are high frequency sea level changes and they are very very cyclic there is one with 100 year cycle 
one with 40,000 year cycle and there is one with the 20,000 uh, year cycles. So these are the so-called uh, high frequency gravitational uh, forces uh, between the, the planets in the solar system and these are high frequency sea level changes. I think uh, this here is the last part of the sea level changes. I told you already that there is the global, that was the eustatic, and the, the three, the long term, medium, and short term, and this is the local. What causes local sea level changes is could be uplifting. Like if you think of Western North America, it's an oceanic continental plate boundary up north, so the mountains are being pushed up, which means in that area it seems like that the sea level is going down. But but realize that even though the global sea level is going up, because of the mountains coming up, it seems like that the sea level is going down. So it's a local thing. And it could be like a subsidence. And it usually is just for that local area. And you don't see it worldwide. And uh, this is where I stop this segment. And I will see you in the next one.